Welcome back, friends. Welcome, Lou. Hey, good morning. How are we? I'm good. Uh, we are in episode 187. My apologies to you, to those of you who are listening to 186. Uh, <laughs> it went on for a long time and then suddenly just dropped. So yeah. <laughs> I think that was at the end there. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was a message to me, Lou, that I was going on too long about the same topic. So actually, I was pretty interested. So. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. I, the point that you were making at the end about uh, when you eat, when Deepak Chopra was saying when you eat, eat, it's not, you know, time for a conversation as well. Right. And it's about right. controlling your attention and controlling your intake. Is That's basically what we're talking about right now. Right. And like, you know, uh, we were taught growing up that when you eat, focus your mind on food from the moment it touches your nose. I mean, your smell, you can smell it. Then from the time it touches your tongue, your body already knows what kind of food you're going to eat. Just from the sight of it, yeah. from the smell of it, before it even goes in. And it can tell exactly what it is, uh, whether you consciously can tell or not. So the, the, these are stories that are probably just stories. But they say that if you put poison in somebody who is a sattvic rishi, knowing what it is, his mind can deal with it and he can eat it and knowing what it is, he can deal with it, whether it's poison or not. Um, yeah. So what, what, if you don't take it to that extreme, if yeah. you say, listen, I, you know, this is not good for me, but I'm going to eat it. Your mind can deal with it is what it's saying. Well, that's funny. The, the example you talked about earlier in the ep last episode about fast food, for example, Oftentimes we're eating fast food and we're not paying attention to eating at all. We're we're into something else. We're on the move. We're driving in the car. Uh, we're not paying attention to the eating as well. So we don't right. reject that food. I, I thought if we sat down and just paid attention to the fast food, we would never eat it. Yeah, probably. <laughs> probably. Yeah. All right. So verse 11 says, now, now he's going to talk about yagna, which is sacrifice, sacrifice of your own ego, sacrifice of your personal needs. This is called yagna. And there's three types of yagna. And he will talk about sattvic yagna, rajasic yagna, and tamasic yagna. The sattvic is the one that we need to aim for. So he says, the sacrifice offered by those people desiring no fruit, no rewards, as the scriptures teach us to, with their minds made up that they should merely sacrifice, that is sattvic yagna. So verse 11 talks about sattvic, verse 12 about rajasic, and verse 13 about tamasic yagna. So yagna is fire worship, but people don't understand exactly the symbolic meaning of a yagna, which I'll go into now, which I think will help a lot of you. It's not necessarily the fire. The, the people have this misunderstanding that people yeah. used to pray to fire. The fire is a symbol of what else we're doing. Here, Yagna symbolizes a conversion of human activity into worship. Keep that in mind. That's a good in sentence. And, and I'll tell you how it is done. Here, first of all, your mind has to be made up that you are there to give, not to take, to sacrifice, not to gain, with no desire for fruit or reward. These are all to be underlined if you're writing it down. Now, in the olden days, there used to be what is known as a kunda, K-U-N-D-A. It, it was a square, usually, it had different shapes, made of bricks or mud that went up about a like, certain height, within which was wood and other flammable articles, and the fire was lit. Around the kunda sat the priests, and they would chant and say prayers. The participants, which was the whole community, the whole village, the whole town, if they came to that place, were the participants. They would bring with them different foodstuffs, that, for example, butter or oil or ghee or grain, and they would come and they would throw it into the uh, fire after bowing down. The fire, as soon as it got the butter, would jump up, right? Yeah. It was like it was... When, the, when you throw butter into a fire or oil, it jumps up. It is like it's accepting what you're giving it, and the fire jumps up. Then what happens is 
when the fire ultimately dies down after so many days of having everybody coming and doing this, everybody's participating. Nobody counts how much grain did you bring? How much butter did you put in? Everybody does whatever they feel is the, to their best of their ability. When the ashes die down, they take three fingers, put it across the ash, and they put it either horizontally or vertically on their forehead. Three stripes. All of these things have meaning. Then after that, well, after they put that, they go to a temple and they pray and they um, eat some sweets. Okay, so what does this all mean? The ashes and the three temples, uh, three stripes, and going to the temple means that you have now merged, you've controlled your three um, uh, sattvic, tamasic, and rajasic qualities. You've controlled your body, mind, and intellect. And now you're ready to go to merge with Brahman. And by eating the sweets, you're saying that I am now a purer person, sweeter person than I was when I was full of rajas and tamas. Um, the kunda itself represents any field of activity, your corporation, for instance. The priests who are chanting are the wise people who are giving us direction. The participants who are throwing in oil or ghee or butter are the people who belong to that corporation. Everybody does work in the company to the best of his ability. Nobody asks, how come you're only doing this much? How come you're only doing that much? I'm doing so much more. No, you just do whatever you can to the best of your ability and, every, and expect that everybody else will do the same. When you put it, then the corporation, the country, the world, everything, the fire jumps up when you put the your uh, your butter in. The corporation does better when you instill in it your own uh, good wishes and your participation. That jumping up of the fire represents the company, the country, the, your local community doing better because of your uh, offerings to the to the community. Then, when everything is finished, the th the ashes as the leftover product. You put it on yourself as three stripes to show that you have burned in the fire your vasanas, your desires, your bad elements, whatever it is about yourself that you have exhausted, burnt out. And then you go past the sattvic, rajasic, and tamasic part. You control your body, mind, and intellect. Now, <clears throat> interestingly, you do this without three things, without artha. Artha means security. All of us want security. So why do you collect so much money? Why are you having so much money? Well, well, I want it for my old age. I want to be secure. I don't want to be dependent on my children and ask them for money. That's artha, security. Um, second is calm, which is pleasure or desire. He says no need for pleasure or desire. And the last is dharma, which is punya, which is good um, deeds. You're doing whatever you're doing for the right reasons, not for any of this. And without any wishes for anything for yourself, no desire for personal uh, rewards. That comes in Rajasik. So here now we're going to be talking about um, Rajasik. Well, before we do that, a couple of other points that I've made to myself. All karmas, all actions lead to bondage, except those done as a yagna or worship. All Karmas lead to bondage, meaning you do more and more, you want more and more, your desires go up. Work, of, work as worship. When you work towards a corporation, your community, your country, as a worship, it is called yagna. The attitude of a karma yoga should be, this is my swadharma. This is what I was born to do. This is my innate nature. I want to do this. Don't do somebody else's duty. Whatever he's good at, you may not be good at. Whatever you're good at, you do that. If you're an intellectual person, um, then don't get up and say, I'm going to be a warrior like him. I'm going to fight the enemy. I'm going to take care of the Taliban or ISIS. No, you're not a fighter. Don't do it. Use your brains. If you're a fighter, don't sit down with books. You do whatever you can do to protect your country. Um, give your don't give your responsibility to somebody else. Your swadharma requires you to fulfill it. All actions should be done as worship. That's called yagna. You have a duty. This is important. You have a duty to the world, 
to all beings, humans, animals, insects, you have birds, you have a duty to your family, to your society, to your country, to nature, to plants, to myself, to God within me, Atman, Brahman, to your ancestors, to human beings, to plants, as worship. If you do that, that's your own worship. That should be enough. If you just treat all of these things that I just mentioned as worship, you, you've done a lot. The Swadharma, which is your own Dharma, as worship of all the above that I mentioned, with no attachment to the result. Key, no attachment to the results. You just do it. Whatever comes as a reward, you accept it as a prasad from God. No attachment to the results. Whatever comes, let it come. Whatever doesn't come, don't worry about it. You just do it because you ought to do it. That's not the goal. If it comes, fine. You know, this is comes with practice. There's, it's always tempting to say, well, how many people, how much, what was the end result? Don't. Try not to. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, verse 12, Rajasic worship. That sacrifice offered, seeking only fruit, not only fruit, but ostentation as well is Rajasic. Yeah. Rajasic yagna, where the performer of that yagna wants the result of the yagna for his personal benefit. Now, you've seen people in every company, every corporation, every country that does good work, no doubt, but is blowing his horn, making sure everybody knows what he did so that he gets the result. That takes away from the sattvic nature of what he has done. He does it for name, for fame, for reputation, for showing off, for getting more money or wealth or power. While he's doing this, his mind is full of desire and lust for wealth, prosperity, etc. It takes away from the peace of mind. Your mind is agitated. You're not getting any benefit for the long run. The attention is on the result when you're acting. So your acting is also not 100% because your mind is not completely concentrated in what it is that you're doing because a large part of it is focusing on what am I getting out of it. You expect something in return. You should have no ulterior motive. The Rajasik has an eye on his gain, whether that is material gain, uh, a praise for somebody else, power, position, all of these are gains. The action is done, therefore, with hypocrisy to show others, to get power, to get a position, not with a pure heart, but with hypocrisy. So you should do good to others with no eye on the benefit to yourself. I'll give you, I don't want to go over again and be cut off in the middle of my sentence, Lou. <laughs> That's okay. how, much, how much time have I used up? Uh, about uh, 12, 13 minutes. Oh, good, good. Okay, so let me give you an example. From early childhood, my mother always taught me to do whatever is the right thing to do without looking for the result. When I was about 22, a friend of mine, we had no money at all. We just finished medical school and we were supposed to be waiting for our internship results. We went to a Mr. Margaukar who was in Bombay, had a large fund that he gave to deserving students. We went to him and we said, we want to go to Switzerland to take an exam. Uh, and he said, fine, I'm going to pay for your airfare. Now, we did not even have money at that time for, to take bus fare to go from one stop to another. We'd often walk for miles because we didn't have the money. Mm. So anyway, we got a ticket from uh, Mumbai, Bombay to Geneva. And we were going to go. It was the middle of December, freezing cold. We had no warm clothes or anything. Then he got us another ticket from Geneva to Paris and back to Mumbai. When we were getting onto the plane in Geneva to go towards Paris, it was supposed to go via London. And they made us swear that we weren't going to get off the plane in London and stay there just because we wanted to see England also. Right. When the plane took off, in those days, there were not too many people on planes. You know, they were fairly empty. I would say maybe 25% of the plane was occupied. Mm -hmm. About three seats ahead of us on the opposite side from the aisle was a lady who was... Have I told the story before, Lou? No, I haven't heard this one. No. <laughs> 
there was an, a lady who was like my mother's age. I was 22 maybe. And she was, I guess, in her 40s or 50s. She was clutching onto the seats with her elbows in the air like this. And you could see that she was looking pale, Indian lady in a sari. And uh, I looked at her and said to my friend, I said, this lady looks so petrified. Now we were full-fledged doctors. We just graduated. Yeah. I said, she looks so scared. Let me go sit with her. There's nobody sitting on either side of her. She's poor lady scared. Let me go sit with her. And he said, sure. So I got up. The plane was just starting to taxi. And it said seat belts on. Nobody's supposed to get up. But I quickly jumped out of my seat and went and sat down next to her. She startled, looked at me. And she's, I said, listen, you look scared. Are you scared? She says, yes. I said, look, I'm like a son to you. You're like my mother. I said, I hope you don't mind. She says, no, 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 please. I held on to her hand and I said, are you afraid of planes? She says, I'm petrified. Mm -hmm. I said, you're going to be fine. And I reassured her, kept talking to her, and I could see visibly she was calming down. By the time the takeoff took place, I distracted her. We got into the air. Now, I had nothing to gain from this. I had not known who she was, what she offered, uh, how much power she had. I was not looking for any return. Turned out that she was the commissioner of customs in India. No. A very, I mean, for those of us who were going to uh, abroad at that time, when you came back, India had nothing, no tape recorders, no radios. Right? People would bring back all kinds of things, but then customs would snatch it. If you knew somebody in customs, you could get away with it. So <laughs> she was a very powerful lady. And as I'm talking to her, and she started to really be grateful to me. She's, you know, she's, she said, oh, you, do you pray? I said, yeah, I pray regularly. I said, I fast. I do. So I was telling her about myself without knowing who she was at the time. She then told me that she had multiple apartments in London that were in the most exclusive areas. And some of them were empty because they had not been rented out. She says, when you come to London, come and stay there. I said, I'm not coming to London because I told that I was going to go straight to Paris. She says, well, when you finish Paris, she says, I will pay for your airfare to come to uh, London. I said, but, you know, we are going to, she said, where are you staying in Paris? I said, we're going to stay in the railroad station, you know, or some youth hostel somewhere. We have no money to stay anywhere else. No, 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 no. Promise me when I get down in London, she says, I'm going to make a phone call. Somebody's going to come to the airport to pick you up and you're going to go stay with that person. Promise me you're not going to leave until you see this uh, this person come to pick you up. I said, fine. Yeah. When we got down in Paris, there was a guy like six feet, six inches tall, dressed in a chauffeur's uniform, very handsome, smart guy with a limo outside. And he took us to the uh, embassy and we were staying at this ambassador's house. He'd given us a whole separate wing to ourselves. We were staying like kings. And wow. he took us everywhere in this chauffeur-driven limousine, which we had to ourselves. We lived like kings in Paris. And then they put us on a plane. We went to London, and she took very good care of us. Bottom line, not to belabor this anymore, um, is that that was exactly what my mother had taught me, that do the right thing, and the rewards will follow. Don't do it for the rewards. Don't make the mistake to say, I'll do this and I'm hoping I'm getting something out of it. No, if you really do it because you ought to do it, the rewards will come. And I can promise you from my heart that if you do the right things, the reward will come. And just keep uh, that. That's the sattvic way of, of, of uh, yajna. Um, now, next one is tamasic. Sacrifice which is severe, severed from ordinance, the scriptures, in which no food is distributed, which is devoid of any mantra, holy words of power, devoid of gift or wealth distribution, devoid of shraddha, faith, that is declared tamasic. So if it's not according to the scriptures, means no food is given. Generally, when you do a yajna, when you do a puja, you, at the end of it, give food to everybody else. That food is symbolic of wealth. What the scripture says, those of you who have, whatever you have, should be prepared to, and therefore should, distribute it to others. The, if you do a yajna and you don't give any food, then that's symbolic of you keeping your wealth to yourself. Right. There's no prasad. 
then it also teach the scriptures teach us that when a guru a teacher teaches you something you have to give what is known as dakshina which is a dakshina is an offering to your teacher uh, of whatever food um, gifts or money whatever it is even though the teachers will never ask you uh, for this is the culture in india they don't ask you why do you give not because the teacher needs it he doesn't need any money doesn't need anything else but it shows your gratitude if you don't give the dakshina you are not grat- grateful therefore you can't grow because a grateful an ungrateful mind cannot absorb you're selfish there's no mantras meaning there's no sacred chance no ideal no goal no purpose so all of these things are mean that this yagna is very tamasic a tamasic worshipper performs the rituals but without looking at the prescriptions of how it is to be performed you're supposed to feed those people there who and distribute your wealth you're supposed to give dakshina to the priests you're supposed to be grateful you're supposed to be humble you're supposed to do mantras and you're supposed to be uh, generous to all of the people there this is the exact opposite of satvik yoga yagna the tamasic is um so no ordinance is followed no food is offered to the brahmins no dakshina is offered we are supported by so many other people right people come to us and help us we give to them not because they're poor but because we're grateful for what they've done what they've done for us people in the community people in your corporation when you have a party what happens you bring people to your house and you give them food and drink you're saying listen you and i work together you do so much for me you've done so many favors let's get together we are supported by so many others you should give them a share of what you're getting out of it um instead the tamasic people steal the credit from others other people do it they steal the credit um they're highlighting their own uh, little action without doing the work there's no trust in others there's no faith in others they're paranoid about others stealing from them they're mistrusting they're doubting um this is all tamasic uh, yagna and it, it doesn't benefit you so the bottom line of all these three verses is peace of mind if you go back to your previous verse which is uh 185 right clue yes. 185 yep. no 186 186 um, yeah, yeah. 186 is the ver- in that i said what is the purpose of all of this and the purpose of all of this is to keep your mind calm not have it agitated because it works nonstop and only when your mind is calm when you are able to focus is when you're going to get the best results for everything and to get closer to your own atman so nice. these last two episodes lu have been very very long and i apologize for that but it's an important point and this is the battle for many of us in our times now for everything is keeping our mind calm it'll help us do anything that we want to do better by being able to control our focus true yep true thank you for joining us friends we'll see you next time we're getting towards the end of uh, chapter 17 one more chapter that's the 18 that sort of summarizes the whole gita thanks lu